Right, let's see if we can get this video done in one go. As promised, a video all about who you are, not who you are, but who the group, the unit you are portraying are. How can you be, how can you have an authentic group if you don't know what unit you are, what regiment you are, what company you are, uh, what the date is? All these factors are very important into getting your impression right. If you don't know the date, you don't know how much stuff you'd be carrying, you don't know where you'd be. You need all this information if you're gonna be accurate and authentic. Without that basic knowledge of what unit you are, exactly what unit you are, um, and what the date is, you stand no hope, absolutely no hope of being accurate I think there's a cat buried in the corner of my room. Okay, um, well, I'm sure we'll find out if um, the shithead is hidden in a lot of boxes. Okay, so first things first. We'll start off with the easy, easy, easy basic stuff. So as you'll all know, on the helmet of the three uh, infantry regiments, parachute infantry regiments, you have one of the playing card symbols. Like, so, for the 502, and for Normandy, a nice big white heart. Normandy painted playing card symbols are larger than the ones used for Market Garden. They started making them smaller and smaller for obvious reasons. Having a giant white target on the side of your helmet isn't the best thing to have. Do not put a hash mark or a dash if you're doing Normandy they those do not feature uh, until market garden there are a few exceptions but we are just talking about the parachute infantry regiments not all the support units not the artillery not the quartermasters not the police anybody like that the ones in question are the 501st the 502 and the 506 we are ignoring everything else in these videos uh, that is by <laughs> those, those three regiments is by far enough to confuse most people, um, as we can see by the standards of, of most groups' impressions. So no hash marks. 501st gets a diamond, the 502 gets a heart, the 506, of course, gets the uh, playing card symbol for the, for the ace, which you'll see 99% of 101st reenactors wearing, and usually with a dash because they don't know the difference. Simple, simple, simple. Nice big... About two inches by two and a half inches tall. Uh, any old white paint. Do not spray paint the damn things on. You do not need to buy a stencil from some dodgy company on eBay or anywhere else. Paint it. If you look at original examples of painted helmets, most are a fucking complete and utter mess. If you can't paint, it doesn't matter. If you can paint like Van Gogh, great. But they don't all look like that. If you don't believe me, pick up a copy of that. Have a look at all the helmets. They go, it goes through many, many different examples. And some of the hearts look like hearts. Others look like blobs. Um, it doesn't matter. Um, do not use a stencil. Do not get one person in your group to paint every single heart. It, it doesn't look right. There should be a real mix Except for the size. The size should always be the same, roughly. And no hash marks. Do not stress this no hash marks thing enough. So, let me move that book out of the way. It's very good, that um, American Paratrooper Helmets. It's an MDT book, so, you know, of course it's good. I'll stick that back on my shelf. I have about six or seven books which live right next to my monitor just there, which are the, always the go-to books. If you're going to do a 50 well, any 501, 502, 506 impression, you should have those books, or somebody in your group should have those books that doesn't mind sharing the information and telling you. Um, they are essential to getting this right. Because I can't put everything in videos, and we can't put everything on the website. It's just too much information out there. So, moving on from the helmet. Now, I've got a whole lot of stuff written down on my other screen. You can't see it at the moment. <coughs> oh, excuse me. <coughs> Good, st <coughs> Good start, eh? <coughs> Most units had identifying marks for the assembly errors. They were supposed to take these off when they got to Normandy. Some 
kept them a lot longer than others. You can see them in D plus 2, D plus 3. And then I'd imagine most start to discard them. Uh, 502 um, second battalion have it on the left shoulder. It's material. It's not. It's not bandaged. We thought it was bandages first. We made that mistake. It's not. It's more like t-shirt, bed sheet. It's that sort of thing. So material that would have been to hand if they had to scrounge it up. Um, cut a lot of it up. Deviate between the group. You know, old bed sheets, any old white cloth, but not bandages. As I said, we, we made that mistake. So 2nd Battalion have it on the left shoulder. 3rd Battalion have it worn like a, a, like a scarf almost. It's a lot thicker. Uh, and 1st Battalion have it on the right shoulder. So just in case you don't know what right is. So left is the one with the chicken, right is the one without for the, for the simpletons. Um, the 501st, the 3rd Battalion have it on the right shoulder also. I have no idea what 1st and 2nd Battalions 501st did. I cannot find any references. Also, finding good pictures uh, from the 501st in Normandy is so, so, so hard. There are very few indeed. 506 have some varied. They don't go with the shoulders at all. Uh, let me grab my helmet. Uh, 506 1st Battalion have a white cross. So one piece of bandage coming down there and one piece of bandage going across the top. It stands out an absolute mile and you can spot that in some pictures. Um, third Battalion paint a white dot on the front of the helmet and on the back. Second Battalion, I'm not sure. I need to keep digging around to see if I can find out what that was. But if you're any of those, so that's six, six different battalions, you have something that if you put it on your uniform, you're unmistakable, you are one of those. Easy, easy. I mean, how difficult is cutting up a piece of white cloth? It's, exactly. It, it's really not, is it? Okay. Let me just skim read as well. Okay. So, each of the three regiments have their own isms. It's a word adopted from one of the first-ish members of uh, Misdrop 44. Now... You'll see the pictures of the blackened faces. Now, each of the three regiments had their own methods. So of course, every some guys did things differently, but taking an overall, uh, uh, sort of an average, if you will, uh, of the guys in the 501st, it's so shiny and thick. It's like the sort of consistency of um, boot polish. It's really, really dark, glossy, very dark and consistent in colour. Um it could be coal dust mixed with something oily, greasy, but it's it's really dark. It's almost boot polish, and it's quite thickly ap applied. 502, um, the first lieutenant Strobel, uh, Wallace Strobel, he, he said that the 502 used a mixture of uh, cocoa, or cocoa, cho yeah, that chocolate powder, Burnt cork and cooking oil. Um, so yeah, you, it's a real mixture with the five hundred two. Um, the five hundred six. <coughs> um, so I'm just skim reading my notes. Um, it's quite light. It's quite a light-ish dusting of. It's probably coal dust from the burners. But it's not applied thick, thick, thick. It's all over, but lighter. Um, but it's good that the 502, especially for, especially for our group, they said exactly what it was made from. I mean, cocoa, burnt cork and cooking oil. You know, strange strange mixture, but okay, it, it works. Um, back to the 501st. We'll go through all the 501st ones now. Uh, you will see in, I would say, quite a few of the 501st pictures, but there's not many 501st pictures. Um, Fairburn Sykes, the commando knives, uh, the 501st and the 101st, sorry, the 101st officers that were in the 501st did a joint forces training program uh, with the British, and some officers were given these as parting gifts, others purchased them, others acquired them uh, through other means. Um, and so those can be seen by quite a few of the officers attached to, you know, 
shoulder straps and belt buckles or belts belt buckles belts and things like that um you also spot one of them carrying a kukri as well one of the, the gurkha knives so don't everybody just go and rush out and buy one of these if you're uh, doing five at first but the officers could justify carrying a british commando dagger not every single officer of course but some in your unit i think it was only the 501st that did that joint forces training exchange program i could be wrong but that's the impression i got from what i read uh may west of course if you're going to carry one of those has the lightning bolt with the g inside for geronimo now unlike the other like, unlike the 502 and the 506 the 501st have a extraordinary amount of di's their divisional insignias on their cap badges uh, their garrison caps um it seems almost it's more often worn than not which is unlike the others which are never seen the 506 and the 502 you just never see the di's um but they're wearing them the 501st are wearing them really early and it's it's great because you know as soon as you're wearing that with your uniform, you everybody knows exactly who you are. Um, so a, a, a nice touch to telling everybody who you are. Uh, the fibers also have a crazy amount of Hawley liners, those big thick cardboard ugly. I think they're horrible things. I mean, I'd like one for the collection, but I don't see the fascination around them. Early cardboard parachute liner. I mean, just the fact that it's made of cardboard, you know, it doesn't excite me much. The 501st seem to have <clears throat> a lot more than any other unit. It's just it's just one of those things. It's the same as the nickel-plated um, crickets for the 502. There's no reason they were just given them. Um, 502. So the unit tapes, you know, all three of the battalions have different tapes. Left shoulder, right shoulder, and worn like a scarf. We mentioned that earlier. Rigger pouches, all the three units have rigger pouches. Um, the 502, they are just <laughs> seem to be worn with excess. Uh, you can see guys with three or four of them. It's not quite as rigger heavy. It doesn't seem to be quite as rigger heavy in the 501 and 506. That's my impression. I could be wrong. I could be talking bollocks. Uh, especially the third battalion, you can see guys with two two on the belt and then two going up the suspenders as well. And also, you don't know what's behind behind at the back of their um, well, behind them, you know, on the back of their webbing because you can't see through people. Uh, if you got a May West, it would be marked with GVM for George Van Horn Mosley, the commander of the five hundred two. That was also stenciled on the parachute harness and the cases. Um, unlike the other regiments of the 101st, the 502 has lots of name tapes visible on the M42s. But get the balance correct if some of your guys are going to have it. Because if you all have it, it's going to look ridiculous. 20%-ish, um, maybe less. Uh, I would go through some, some good good books. Um, and, and again, I can't, I can't recommend the two... MDT Carantan books, as you can see, I mean, they are littered with um, <laughs> with uh, post-it notes to mark pages for different reasons. Uh, yeah, I, I twenty percent at most. Your members, if if you want name tapes, because yeah, it will just get absurd otherwise. Helmet scrim five hundred two is helmet scrim, helmet scrim, helmet scrim. There are no exceptions. You need a net. You need scrim. Don't get shitty scrim from soft. That that's plain, natural hessian. Dark greens, light greens. You know, military greens, not bottle greens, not luminous greens, not lime green. Uh, browns, a mixture of browns, light, dark, chocolate. You know, it's, this is the colours you want to go for. Not the cheap shit you'll see for sale everywhere. Um, the amount varies. The amount does vary from sort of a, a medium amount to uh, you look like a bush. Um, odd thing about the 502, not everybody did this, but a lot did. The Carlisle pouch and the water pouch are right at the centre of the back. And the first aid pouch is worn to the left 
of the water bottle. Now, not, I'm saying not everybody did this, but if you look at the pictures of guys you can see from the back, it does seem to be quite a trend. Uh, obviously, the Carlisle pouch is something you're not going to use, so you stick it in the middle of the back out the way. You know, you've got all the important stuff like your ammunition, your knife, your bayonet at the front that you need that you can get to easily. Also, the 502 have a lot of British webbing. Again, it's probably just one of those things. They were just sent webbing and in amongst that stuff was a lot of British webbing. You can see suspenders, you can see musette bags, you can see Carlisle pouches. Uh, I think you can see water bottle covers. So if you're doing a 502, you want a mixture of British webbing in amongst across the across the board, not just you know one guy wearing a complete set of British made US webbing. That is not done. One piece of webbing per person at a max. Um, it's easy. It is easy enough to find if you look around for it. It is a bit more money, but you know it's something different, and it will certainly hold its value as long as it's not going to fall apart the second you you buy it and wear it and trash it. The 502 got a whole load of nickel-plated crickets. These were made before the war uh, by the Acme Thunder and Whistle Company um, in Birmingham. Uh, Jewelry Quarter, I think they're still there. Um, Hudson's, they made Hudson's, Hudson's Whistle. is fam famous for the Hudson Whistle during World War One. You know, the long, skinny, like the policeman's whistles. Uh, they made all of these as musical timekeepers or clicker clackers. I don't know. I, I don't know. They were made for the music industry. The 101st or the American government or the War Department or somebody went to them and said, look, we'll have all you've got and we want X amount more. So they said, right, take all these ones, which are the nickel plated ones. And they all, all seemed to go to the 502. I wouldn't be surprised if others went to 501, 506. But the majority certainly went to the 502. And then when the brass ones were made, manufactured specifically for this order, they went to the 501 and the, and the 506. So if you want, again, something a bit different to say, hey, I'm 502, pick up a nickel-plated cricket. So I've started doing... Um, the ones made by the same company, Acme Hudson's in Birmingham. They are, I think they're about tenner, um, and they are spot on. They even come in little fancy cardboard boxes, but of course that's not really no good to you, because <clears throat> as soon as you take it out, they've just got an empty box. Mine actually lives over there, and I think it's got a lot of crap in it, or dog tags and things. Um, but they are a, a nice, little, nice little touch. Uh, 506, as I said, have the white cross on their helmets, and the painted white dot. And I don't know about the second battalion. I can't remember. Um, some of the 506 have the M1 ammo pouch. As in what most people call the carbine mag pouch. You only normally get one if you're going to wear one. I don't think there's any pictures of anybody wearing two. I could be wrong. I would err on the safety of only wearing one. You do spot them sewn to other items like the carbine leg, um, scabbards, holsters, whatever you call it. You call it a scabbard. Um, yeah, I think it's the only real... I wouldn't wear it if you were 501 or 502, but the 506 do seem to wear the odd one. Uh, the May Western Mark with an RS for Robert Sink. Also onto the parachute harness and cases. Unlike the 502, the 506 didn't use much scrim. I mean, the 502 are really, really heavy scrim, and the 506 is sort of from light to a, a medium. Um, most 506 helmets show a net, not all. So if you know, so you can get away with, well, depending on the size of your group, a small percentage without a helmet net. Uh, it gives a stark con a contrast to the 502. If you had a group of 506 reenactors who have done a good impression and against a, a lot of 502 reenactors with a good impression, you will clearly see a vast difference just in the, just in the helmet net and the uh, scrim. Uh, as 502 got the nickel-plated crickets, the 502 should always go with the brass ones. Um, one of the weird things in the 506, although they were... Issued along with the same with the same as the 502, they were given the um, M5 rubber rubberast. 
rubberized gas mask bags, you can spot a few people using the old canvas service ones. Not I mean I'm not talking many. I'm just talking you can spot a few more than one a, a few guys doing this why who who knows you know i think it's just one of those weird things again keep it to the ratios if you've got 10 guys in the group have one if you've got 20 guys in the group probably still only have one uh keep it low 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 down it's just one of those little quirks that somebody can have in miss drop 44 i've got i've got a spreadsheet of everybody what they own where it comes from you know so we always know how to improve what to look for each person can have a certain amount of quirks so what bit of british webbing they have if they have a name tape um if they have like if like the um canvas service gas mask bag if we were doing five or if somebody wanted one of those that would go on there so you don't get one person with you know every possible quirk going because it, it just looked it looked ludicrous um Right. Also, you need to know the date. Now, it, it's a tricky one because there's no firm set rules here apart from the obvious. You know, you jump out of your plane, you hit the ground. The first thing you do is lose your shoot. So almost unless you're doing pre-jump, nobody really needs a parachute uh, and harness. Same as the May West, that would have been lobbed. Your Griswold bag would have been lobbed. So apart from that, everything else is a bit of a... Would you have got rid of it then? Would you have kept it just in case? So you can take all this with sort of a, a, a big, big, big pinch of salt. Use some common sense. Mix it up with your group so that not everybody has abandoned everything. Some guys have still got bits and pieces. Um, so like the first thing I think most people probably would have got rid of was the drop rope. Once you're on the ground, you, you I mean, rope's useful. You can use ropes for building shelters. You can use rope for moving things. You can pull things up the outside of a building with rope. So it does have a function. But do you want to lug that thing around? Probably not. So from D plus one, most people are going to start losing those, chucking them in hedges. Some guys, of course, will keep them. Uh, your gas brassard from, like, you know, D plus one onwards. It's made of cardboard. <laughs> you'll have jumped out of a plane you'll have hit the ground you'll have taken your webbing off you'll have taken your parachute off you will have slung your rifle to and this thing will get battered up um, it's cardboard it, if you landed in water if you got wet if you went through a hedge all of this is going to be used and abused if you've just gone to Soldier of Fortune and bought a brand new shiny unfolded gas bazaar and you put it on your shoulder and you're going to go and then tell people it's you know D-Day plus six just really really i mean you've, you've got to get into the th thought process of <laughs> um of how this stuff would age what happens to it what it's been through there's no point turning up with um you know a blackened face and telling you it's d-day plus six what so in those six days you didn't wash uh no weather no rain no sweat really you didn't scratch your face unless you're doing d-day plus one or, you know, the, the very next morning. That shit ain't going to be on your face. Unless you've gone with the boot polish look. Then, you know, that's a bit more harder. Uh, harder wearing. <clears throat> I mean, you do have a spare gas brassard in your um, M5 rubberized, rubberized gas mask bag. So, you could have put that on. But even so, you know, that's going to have been battered up even just being in there with the gas mask and all the bits and pieces rummaging around um tape fabric tape the white and the black tape that you see all the suspenders tied up with some troopers they taped up uh well every, anything that can be taped up really uh, let's face it if it can be opened it can be taped closed rigger pouches uh the thompson mag bags gp bags Wrap the tape round it to keep it closed. You can see that on everything. But of course, if this is D-Day plus two and further, the chances are most things are going to be ripped open. The tape can still be on there. It's just going to be open and torn. So, you know, it's just going to flap around. Again, it's a nice little attention to detail that shows that you did that and opened it. Um, bandoliers, 
bandoliers are a funny one. You, you see them so heavily used by reenactors, but then you look in the pictures for going forwards. They seem to be very, very prominent in the early stages. So plus one, plus two, plus three. And they seem to, I think, they seem to get less frequent the further you go on. The, that need for carrying so much ammunition, uh, that worry of we need so much ammunition, is, is sort of, um, well, it's gone. You, they, they've learned so much by now. I mean, when the, the 101st and the 82nd jumped into Normandy, they carried everything. They wanted something for every situation. I mean, this is unknown. This is untested warfare at this time uh, for the Allies. So they wanted to take everything. I mean, they've got Hawkins mines. They've got gammon grenades. They've got pineapple grenades. They've got ammunition coming out of their ears. You know, they, they've got so much stuff. If you compare the Normandy jump to Market Garden jump, the Holland jump, um, the, the differences are vast. They really are. And the ammunition carried and the ammunition expenditure is also, again, it's vastly different. So you want ammunition, um, you want bandoliers, certainly for early, early. But as you go further on, you've got more space in your pack. You've got, you've just got more space in general where you'll have used things and things can be replaced. So bandoliers are one, if you really want one, crack on. Um, this, I'm not saying you shouldn't, I'm just you know, giving you my interpretation of skimming through all these thousands of photos. Um, I mean, I can't stand them personally. Um, so, and then we get on to sort of, sort of, um, the hell am I, <laughs> Queen? We go on to D-Day plus two, plus three, your uniform is not going to look like it's come out of a box. Or out of a packet from Soldier of Fortune. It shouldn't anyway, because you would have, you will have CC2 that, of course. But now on top of that CC2, you're going to have dirt, you're going to have mud, you're going to have grease and oil and everything else. You'll have crawled through. Um, you could have blood all over it, you know, because funny enough, in war people get killed, and sometimes you have to carry people, move people. You might have been wounded, um, so you are not going to be clean. If your jumpsuit is clean, there's something very wrong. This is not the hobby for you. Go, go take up knitting or golf or something. Um, uh, 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 yeah, get, get dirty. Um, so, yeah, and as you go on into so D-Day plus 3, D-Day plus 4, the, certainly the scarves for the 3rd Battalion, 50, is it 3rd? First, third, third, I think. Uh, that would have gone. I mean, wearing a massive what that would have gone pretty much straight away as soon as they hit the ground. You don't want to be wearing a massive, great big white scarf that says who you are. But the ones around the tape, around the shoulders, the um, fabric tape. No, it's not tape, is it? You know what I mean? That that thing there. Um, <laughs> yeah, that. Um, it's just a bit of cloth. Uh, it's not in the way. It's not obtrusive. It's not doesn't stand out a mile, mile. Um, so DDA plus three and onwards, you probably would have gone, you know, fucking thing, I can just get rid of that now. Things like the 506 with a cross on the helmet, I'd imagine that would have gone almost immediately. Uh, it's bad enough having a giant white playing card symbol, so let alone a massive cross on the top of your head to mark, mark your head as a nice target. Uh, 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 um. Rubberized gas mask bags, most guys ditched this. They, it was, you know, the, the, the need and the worry for using gas to repel the invasion had gone. So you either would have chucked the whole thing into a hedge while nobody was looking, thrown the contents into a hedge, or maybe picked some bits you might have kept for a reason and stashed them in your musette bag. But the bag itself does have a function. It's a rubberized waterproof bag. Now, this is the only bit of water waterized? Oh my God, listen to me. Uh, only bit of water waterproof kit that you've you've been issued. Uh, I can't remember what trooper in the 506, he said he literally put it, it inside his musette bag and used it as a liner and then everything else went inside that. Yeah, genius, of course. For us, I mean, you, nobody knows you haven't done that because people don't look inside your musette bag. So you might as well just not buy one if you're going to claim it's there. Um some of the engineers stashed all the things like the primers, the deck cords, matches, because they were worried about if it got wet, it would be trashed. And then the gas mask went into the musette bag or they did something with it. 
Um, but yeah, so DDR plus three, you, you want to start really losing those. Cohen plus four, plus five, your pockets should be vastly emptier. I do not mean empty. I mean emptier. Now, you'll have used your ammo. You'll have used a lot of the stuff you've been carrying. You'll have thrown a load of shit away you didn't want and you didn't want to be lugging around and have no use for. However, um, lots of guys in the American, well, all the military, like to collect and obtain souvenirs. So, although you're, pardon me, although you're getting rid of your US kit, you may be acquiring souvenirs. And don't all go out and buy a Luger. It's not It's not an excuse to now suddenly run round with MP40s, K98s, MG42s. I mean small things that fit in your pockets. Fair passes. Uh, although you're not supposed to take them, which goes against all the information that the S2 will give you in captured documents. But we may touch along that later on, because I saw a ludicrous video of a lot of reenactors pretending to capture Germans and then bully them, and it was just absurd. Um, I didn't watch all of it. I thought I might review that one day. So we may look at that later on. Um, you shouldn't take dog tags. You shouldn't take ver passes. You shouldn't take insignia. Of course, guys did. They wanted these things, you know. Um, did it? Does it do any harm? Potentially, but probably not. Um, medals, badges, anything that could be gained anything with a swastika at, a swastika on it was you know considered a, a, a fairly good souvenir um and also all this stuff easily fits in pockets bum, bum, bum. parachute first aid packets were issued to all regiments um they were not worn on the helmet until market garden you do see the odd odd one and i do mean the odd one i think i can only think of one picture off the top of my head with a guy on his helmet. Um, so lots of guys tied it above where the Carlisle pouch goes. So the two things are together, which makes perfect sense. You can see it tied to shoulders, but you know that's where your rifle goes and it could get in the way. Also, grenades don't hang them from whichever side you put the butt of the rifle into because as soon as you get a shoulder it, you go crack and it... It just doesn't work. You wouldn't put anything on the shoulder you want to shoulder a rifle in. It's just, you just wouldn't do it. Um, what else do we need to touch on to getting the impression so it says who you are? There is a cat in here. It's hiding in a box because it just shook its head and its ears went duk, 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 onto the side. Um, I can't see a cat. Um, what else? I can't think of anything off the top of my head. I'm sure there is other things, because I'm never going to get everything in one of these videos. I don't claim to be perfect. I don't claim to know it all. I just seem to know some stuff. So, nothing in all of that is difficult. Unless unless I'm mistaken. Um, cutting up a bit of white cloth. Sticking it on the appropriate shoulder. Or making a cross on your helmet. A blob of white paint, uh, say you're in the 506th 3rd Battalion, I think. I can't, I can't remember. Um, let me just scroll back up. Whee! God, it goes long. Yeah, the 3rd Battalion. So they have a big white dot uh, on the front and the back of the helmet. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's really, really easy to do basic things, but nobody seems to do it. So, who you are and the date are key. And they are a nightmare to pin down because there are many advantages to doing different dates. There are many advantages to doing different units. So, it, it took us a good, good lengthy discussion spread over uh, probably a good month to decide what we were. And we knew we were 502. And I think we decided on 2nd Battalion straight away. I, I can't... I think that was from, from pretty much day one. But pinning down the date we wanted to do was a bit more tricky. Um, and again, it, it's completely personal preference. There's no right, there's no wrong, obviously, because, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a moment in history you're going to 
uh, reproduce, recreate, reenact, whatever you whatever you want to whatever you want to call it. So that's that's actually a lot harder than doing the things like cutting up some white cloth. Anyway, I've just noticed that this is thirty five minutes. Wow. So I am going to sign off unless I can think of anything in the next few seconds. Mm, no. Right. I hope some of that was informative. Um, you can you know, rewind and jump about. If you have any questions, you can question, question me. Oh, Jesus. Yeah, you can interrogate me on here or you can get me through the misdrop44.co.uk website. There's loads of information on there too. Uh, it's mostly based around 502, but a lot of it is general 501st information. You won't find the things like 1st Battalion 506, what they wore, because we're 502 and if i put everything on there it would just become a whole jumbled mess of 502 um info so it's it's mainly 502 but there is stuff applicable to all units so it's there to be used and abused you can message me through there you can get me on here okay i hope you found this useful guys thanks for watching laters